you're a student, you're dismissed to go be with Miss Ivy and Mr. Nick and Mr. Larry and I don't know who all else, but don't if you hadn't been able to find a chair, now you can. Um, hello, Cartier. Cool glasses. Mm -hmm. Welcome, I greet you in the name of my Savior, uh, the one we've been singing about. Hi, Meredith. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks. Um, I'm happy you're here today. I, uh, I trust the Lord's got a word for us, and I hope that you'll accept my appeal um, I really believe God wants to speak to you today. I believe He wants to speak to me today. He has spoken to me already this week. And um, tell you what, Lord Jesus, I just um, a blind man cannot see the sun. A deaf man cannot hear Mozart a man with no taste buds cannot enjoy the most delicious meal God only you can give us eyes that can see only you can give us ears that can hear only you can give us mouths that are able to taste and that are hungry and thirsty. I ask you to be kind to us and give us those abilities today. And I pray that your word would go forth and do that which it only can do. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You got a copy of the scriptures. I wish you turned to Acts 27. Um, I'm going to read some of this chapter to us, but let me give you a little background. Uh, this is a chapter right near the end of the book of Acts. And it's the, it's the rather remarkable account of the Apostle Paul's journey from Jerusalem in Israel, 1,500 miles, to Rome in Italy. And what makes it remarkable is not the events of the story are remarkable, but what, at least the smart dudes that I read, what makes the story uh, remarkable also is how much detail Dr. Luke gives us about this trip. It's, it's like he, nobody else would, would have given the, the detail, and you'll see it. The detail in this story that's given doesn't fit. It's, it's unusual. Uh, most of the time when the Bible talks about people going on journeys, they don't tell us the detail. That says something to me. That means something to me. That for God through Dr. Luke... To give us this kind of detail about the, this journey of Paul from Jerusalem to Rome. Uh, that means there's something special here. You all know Dr. Uh, Paul. He was a doctor as well of, of Old Testament theology for sure. Uh, he was a Jew. Uh, he was a Pharisee. What was a little unique is that he was a Roman citizen. He was a tent maker. Most people that dealt in academics in this day had another job because they couldn't make a living. Nothing's really changed, has it? But you couldn't really make a, a, a real living as a teacher. And so they had to do something else to supplement their income. And uh, Paul was a tent maker as well as a Pharisee and a teacher. Uh, another thing that makes Paul unique is that he was a student of the most revered Jewish rabbi in that day in the world. His name was Gamaliel. 
And it would be like if uh, George is a, is a really good cook. Uh, and if, he, if, if I said, I'm going to introduce George to you. And uh, he spent a couple of years studying under Bobby Flay. Wow, that's a deal. That's, that, that's impressive. The Apostle Paul literally was a revered student of the most revered rabbi in the Jewish world named Gamaliel. He was brilliant. Even secular scholars would say that anyone that could write the book of Romans had a, a superior mind. Uh, he was obviously, if you've read the New Testament at all, he was very zealous for his beliefs. He quotes the Old Testament. Not parts of the Old Testament. Not Psalm 23 or Genesis 1 or, or Psalm 1. He had memorized the Old Testament. So he was very, very impressive. And uh, uh, we are sort of introduced to Paul in the Bible uh, as he's in the process of trying to destroy the early New Testament church. He's very zealous. He sees Christianity as a threat to Judaism. And it is his, it is his mission in life, his self-appointed mission in life to try to destroy the early church that had been established by the Lord Jesus and the apostles. Um, let me see here real quick. Let me just give you a couple of other things. Uh, on one of these, I'm going to destroy Christianity missions, mission trips. Uh, he uh, is heading to Damascus to, to arrest and kill the Christians that live in Damascus. And on the way, Jesus himself appears to Paul. This happens about 35 A.D., just if you care about 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 well a few years. Let me just say it this way: a few years after Jesus died and rose again, uh, Jesus appears to him and says, "Paul, I have chosen you. I love you. I'm. I, I, you are mine. You don't know it yet, but you're mine." And Paul says, "Okay," and he puts his faith in Jesus as the Messiah, the one that. The Old Testament that he had memorized was proclaiming. Paul didn't see it until then, but his eyes were open. He goes, oh my gosh. All these, the, this, this book, the Old Testament, if you will, these 39 books that I've memorized in the Old Testament, they all proclaim this Messiah's coming and danged if he didn't appear to me and has told me that I'm his. Um, and Paul puts his faith in him and then Paul leaves, sort of goes away for three years and studies, uh, he has to go back and he has to reprocess all of his studies about the Old Testament. Uh, because now all of a sudden he's reading the Old Testament with Jesus running through it. And before that, Jesus wasn't in the Old Testament for him. But so all of a sudden he sees Jesus running through the, uh, through the uh, Old Testament. He comes back from this three years of, um, this three year sabbatical, if you will, to re-indoctrinate his, his mind. And he um, begins going everywhere, telling everybody about Jesus. He can't stop. He can't help himself. Um, he, he, he is, he, he's excited about who Jesus is. And he wants his fellow Jews to know about Jesus. And so he starts telling, them, telling Jews everywhere about the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. He begins to lead people to the Lord in huge numbers. He begins to plant churches throughout the Roman Empire. And what's very significant, if you study the life of Paul, is that the early church very quickly recognized that Paul was an apostle. He wasn't just a devoted, zealous lover and follower of Jesus. The early church very quickly, uh, the apostles and the early church both very quickly recognized that Paul had been ordained by God to be one of the early church fathers, one of the, uh, the apostles. Paul's main message is that non-Jews can come to Christ without becoming Jews first. This idea that the Old Testament was written just to Jews this idea that, the, that, that the, in the Jewish mind, Gentiles were not welcomed into, the, into relationship with Jehovah, the God of the Old Testament. That, that's wrong. I don't know who came up with that, but I've heard that a lot. And that's wrong and stupid. 
just so you know. Okay, so if you hear that, say, that's wrong and stupid, okay? No, no, the, the Old Testament is filled with examples of Gentile people joyfully being in, uh, 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 welcomed into, the, into a relationship with Jehovah God, the God of the Old Testament. The rub was that that was true. But for a, a non-Jew, a Gentile, a Rahab, the harlot, just, just by example, uh, but there's, I could give you dozens and dozens of examples uh, uh, Naaman, the dude with the leper, the leprosy guy. These are these are all Gentile people. They could come to know uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, God, the Jehovah God. The the thing was that for them to come into relationship with Jehovah God and to be welcomed into this faith, they had to adopt the lifestyle and the belief system of the Jewish faith. That's the rub. For, for a non-Jew to Rahab, she clearly, because she became a part of the Jewish nation, she became a part of the line of Christ. But Rahab started following the Old Testament Jewish laws. And every other Gentile that, it, that, that came into uh, uh, the, Jew, the, the faith into Jehovah God, with Jehovah God had to do that. Paul's message is unique in that he is the very first person whose primary message, I realized Peter was the first, but Peter, it was not his main message. Paul's main message was he went everywhere telling non-Jews, you can come into relationship with God not through following the Jewish laws and rules, but solely through faith in Jesus. And we might think, well, duh, of course, but in that day, that was revolutionary. That was, in fact, even the apostles were very nervous and it took them a number of years to get to a point where they agreed with that message. Non-Jews can be brought into relations first but without adopting the Jewish religious laws first. Uh, what makes Paul's life significant is that he planted probably many, many, many more churches than this, but we know of, that he planted 14. He planted 14 churches, Ephesus, Philippi, Thessalonica, uh, etc. Okay? He planted these churches, um, um, but he probably planted a lot more. What else is significant about Paul's life, is, as far as lasting impact, is that he uh, wrote 14 books of the New Testament. And you might think, uh-uh, he only wrote 13. Well, you just keep growing and you'll, you'll come to the realization that he wrote, that he wrote 14, okay? Um, okay, so let me read uh, Acts 27 to you real quickly, or at least part of it. Paul is traveling from Jerusalem to Rome. This is about 25 or, well, let's just say 25 years after Paul becomes a Christian. And um, he is, his, his impact, upon the world, not just the Jewish world or the Gentile world, but his impact upon the world as far as spreading Christianity is unbelievable. It's, it's immeasurable. And as his impact grows, so does opposition to his message. And on one journey where he's going back to Jerusalem, to uh, he was a Jew, so he, periodically he wanted to go back to Jerusalem and he wanted to celebrate the Jewish holidays and he wanted to be around his family and his friends and uh, you know everybody likes to go home. Well, most everybody likes to go home, and uh, 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 he wanted to go home. But while he was back in Jerusalem, uh, op opposition had grown and he is arrested on false charges, but he is still arrested and. Uh, uh, he, has, he goes through a, a minimum of four different trials before four different Roman officials. He goes through two assassination plots. And finally, the, the, the ruling Roman governor, if you will, finally this, this has become so convoluted and confusing and difficult and tumultuous 
the, the Jewish people are trying to kill Paul. And he doesn't, this is a hot potato. It's a tar baby. And he doesn't want it on his hands anymore. So he says, Paul says, send me to Rome. And, and the governor says, good. <laughs> Go to Rome. And so uh, Paul is, is sent to Rome from Jerusalem to stand trial for these accusations that have been made against him uh, by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. Okay, so that's why he's going to Rome. All right, let me read this to you real quickly, at least part of it. Acts chapter 27. Acts is the fifth book in your New Testament, if you're wondering. It says, when it was decided uh, that we, we being Luke, Luke is with Paul. That's why the pronoun is we. We would sail for Italy. Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius who belonged to the imperial regiment. Uh, this trip took place in late fall. That's very significant to the story. Uh, if you took this same trip from Jerusalem in a boat to Rome, if you took it in the spring and the summer, it would take 10 days. If you took this trip in the fall or the winter, it took 30 to 50 days because the wind changed and the wind is against you. So that's why uh, it winds up taking a long time for them to get there. Let's see. We boarded a ship from Adramatidum uh, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province. It says Asia, but it's Asia Minor. And we put out to sea. And Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon and Julius, and that's the Roman, his guard, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. From there we put out to sea again. And we're, what he's doing is he's going up the Mediterranean Sea coast along Asia Minor. And he's about to turn and start heading west trying to get to Rome. That's sort of the direction we're going. Um, from there we put out to sea again and passed uh, to the Lee of Cyprus. The, anytime you see the word Lee, L-E-E, -E, that means the, the protected side. The side that's protected from the wind and the waves. Uh, uh, and we passed uh, to the Lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in uh, Lycia. I don't know why it's hard for me to say Lycia. Uh, just FYI, I think it's interesting. Um, uh, Myra, the little island of Myra, that's where the real live, I'm not joking, Myra is where the real live Santa Claus, St. Nicholas is from. Just FYI, he wound up up at the North Pole. But in real life, he, he was born and raised and lived his adult life most of his adult life until he, 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 elves didn't like island life for some reason. But anyway, that's another thing. Uh, but he's from Myra, uh, off the coast in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, there the centurion found an Alexand Alexandrian ship, that's North African ship, sailing for Italy. It was full of grain. Egypt was the breadbasket for Rome. And so ships were constantly going from North Africa where there was a lot of wheat raised and taken to Rome because that's where all the population was. And, and uh, Julius put us on board. We made slow headway for many days because the wind was against them and had difficulty arriving at Snidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete opposite Siloam. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lacia. Much time had been lost. This isn't going to be a 10-day journey. This is going to be more like a, at least at this point, they're thinking a 30 to 50-day journey. Uh, much time had been lost and sailing was, had already become dangerous because by now it was after the, the fast. He's saying it's in late fall. That's what he's trying to say. It's getting late. Fall is, in this day, fall was difficult sailing. Winter was dangerous sailing. Um, let's see. So Paul warned the, the men on the ship. Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and the cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion 
instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. They're the experts. Everybody knows you listen to experts instead of to God. Right? Experts know stuff. Experts know stuff that God doesn't know. God gives Paul a message. Tell them to stop that ship. If they don't stop that ship, they're going to experience great loss. So Paul said, hey guys, the Lord's given me a message. We're supposed to stop this ship right here and spend the winter on this island. And the, uh, the, uh, everybody said, well, you're the captain of the ship and you're the owner of the ship. You've got all this experience uh, with the Mediterranean Sea and with sailing ships. What do y'all think? And their counsel was different than God's counsel. Okay? Let's see here. Since the harbor was unsuitable in winter, the majority, you've heard me say many times, never is there an example in the Bible where the majority were ever right. Never in the Bible, Old or New Testament, is there an example where the majority are ever right. But everybody thinks the majority is right, so they, uh, they know something. Combined lunacy seems to transform into wisdom for some reason, but uh, we'll move on. Let's see. Uh, so the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. The harbor, this was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought that they had obtained what they wanted. That's poor wording. What it really means is, what they're saying is, when a gentle wind blew the right direction, they took it as a sign. That's always a good way to live life. That's the best way to make your decision. Signs. Should I... What car should I buy? First car I saw was a blue Mazda. That's a sign. Who should I invite for dinner? And the phone rings. It's George. That's a sign. I should invite you. We, 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 we. Anyway. They thought, here's a gentle wind blowing in the right direction. That's a sign. Bad plan. Uh, let's see. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. But before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeastern swept down from the island. And the ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. And as we passed to the lee of a small item, island called Cauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to try to hold it together, to keep it from breaking apart because of the waves. Fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Sridus, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. wonder if two weeks earlier... Somebody had walked up to that ship, docked at a port with a shovel and started shoveling that grain out into the bay. What do you think the captain and the owner of that ship and the, the sailors and the people that were in charge of the grain, wonder how they'd have seen that. It's amazing how in such a period of time that which used to be worth an incalculable amount of wealth becomes so worthless that they throw it into the sea. It's amazing how things that we value one day get a phone call from a doctor from St. Jude and that car, that dent in your car door, that literally you would have killed somebody over. What, what car door dent? Your stock, your, your uh, 
investment person uh, uh, let send you a notice that your stock has gone down two points. That tear in your couch. That broken light switch. It's amazing how in such a brief period of time that which one day we would have died for doesn't mean anything at all. Uh, we began to throw the cargo overboard. That's the grain. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle. That's the mask and the sails uh, overboard with their own hands. When neither the sun nor the stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. You ever felt that way? Boy, I have. You're laying in your bed at night and you're looking up at the ceiling or what you think's the ceiling. And you have come to the conclusion there is no way out. I am doomed. My, my fate is sealed. I cannot change this. My future, it's doomed. They finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice. Now, you could call Paul, I told you so, dude. <laughs> you know, <laughs> boy, it's a bummer when you're <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I... My son-in-law called me two days ago, and uh, he's remodeling their new home. He asked me how much money I thought it would cost to remodel it, and I gave him an amount of money. And uh, he, oh, no, I can do it for X amount. He called me <laughs> two days ago. He would kill me for telling you all this. He said... Um, you know, you were right. <laughs> it cost exactly that amount. How did you know? And I said, well, I've just remodeled houses before. I know. It drove him crazy. That I, you know. Anyway, he said, men, you should have told, you should have taken my advice and not sailed from Crete. Then, now here's the point of my message today. Then, or if you had taken my advice, you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night an angel of God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as God told me. Whew. Mm. Um... The rest of the story is they sail along for two more weeks. Uh, it's so dark and stormy that they don't even know where they are. Uh, they finally uh, crash into an island, and there's 264, 65 of them. I'm not, I forgot the exact number, but there's 265, let's just say, people. Every one of them make it to shore. Lose everything else, lose the ship, lose the tackle, lose the sails, lose the mask, lose the ropes, lose all the supplies, lose all that grain, all that cargo. But every person is saved. Um, I've got three things that I want us to think about today. Two little ones and one big one. Okay? Number one, I want you to think about the trip itself 
Paul going from Jerusalem to Rome. I find it very significant that Paul is taken from Jerusalem to Rome. The reason I find that significant is that you would know this by reading the book of Acts, but if you read the first chapter of the book of Romans, Romans was written uh, a couple of years before this, ex- this event, Paul's shipwreck, happens. And what's significant to me is that in Romans chapter 1, Paul says this, One thing I continually pray for is the opportunity, God willing, to come and visit Rome. Paul wanted to go to Rome. He didn't want to just go see the sights. He wanted to go and tell the people of Rome the message of Jesus Christ and the good news that he died on the cross for them just like he did for everybody else in the world. But what is meaningful to me is that God heard Paul's prayer. I don't know whether it was in the vast scheme of eternity, a billion, zillion, trillion years earlier that God and Gabriel were saying, what do you think? What are we doing about Paul and traveling arrangements? What do you think? Well, you think we ought to go to Rome? I don't know. Should he go to Rome? Let's all, let's have a big discussion about this. Gabriel, what do you think? What, Elijah, what do you, you know? No. All I, I don't know that. I don't know about the sovereignty of God in this deal. What I know is, is that a man that was loved of God had a desire, had a hope, had a wish. He wanted to go to Rome. And God heard his prayer. And God made a decision to honor his request. That's why the Bible says that all of God's promises are you. And by definition, great fathers love to say yes. They have a yes face. Do they sometimes have to say no? Sure. But their first face, their first response is yes. Now tell me what you want. That's what great dads do. They don't say no first. They're not grumpy first. They have to say no sometimes. Especially if the request would harm the one that's asking. Of course they're going to say no. But Paul had a desire to do something noble and good and wonderful. And God said yes. That's why David says delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. In 1 John 3, John says, What great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7 that if you, being evil fathers, know how to do good things for your children, how much more so will your heavenly Father give you anything and everything When you ask. Paul asked. And God said yes. Hebrews 4. Paul says let us with confidence draw near to to God's throne of grace. That we may find grace and experience God's help in his perfect timing. And then in James 4. The half brother of Jesus says. We do not have because we do not ask. And sometimes we don't have because we ask with wrong motives. But my point, Paul asked. What Wonder if Paul had never asked. Wonder if Paul had stopped asking. Wonder what would have happened. I don't know and you don't either. What I know is that Paul had a noble, honoring, honorable, good desire and he continually asked God and God said, Dead gummit, yes! Yes! What you asking for?
what you ask him for. I'm not talking about jet skis and Cadillacs and silliness. Silliness. What are you asking from God? What did you used to ask for? And you've stopped asking. God saved my dad. God saved my daughter. God fill my son with peace. God give me a job where I can be an influence and a light and salt and, ha and have impact upon the people that I work with. What, what are you asking for? Don't stop. Because sometimes God just... But what if it's not a part of His plan? What if it's not a part of the vast kingdom strategy? Maybe it's not. But sometimes God just... Because He's a dad and He loves you, He says, yes. Don't, don't, don't stop. Hey, hey, Carl, Carl. Hey, Carl. Carl. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Bless you. Second thing about that trip. God had told Paul in Acts 23, I want you to go to Rome. I want you... Same time, the same time. This was just two chapters earlier, but it's the same event. God said, Paul, you're going to Rome. And you know what's remarkable? In chapter 28, verse 14, you know what the Bible says? I'm, now this is to shock you. Do you know what it says in Acts 28, 14? And Paul arrived in Rome. How many obstacles, how many uh, 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 people were trying to stop it from happening? How many? All of nature is against it. All of Israel is against it. There's too much opposition. There's too many problems. God made Paul a promise. God made Paul a promise. And when God made Paul a promise, it happened. You know why? God always keeps His promises. What God says always comes true no matter what, no matter how long, no matter how impossible, no matter how unrealistic, no matter how politically incorrect, no matter how offensive. God always keeps His promises no matter what, no matter what, no matter what. That's why Joshua said, in Joshua 21, not one of God's good promises that he has made to his people has failed. Number two. That verse that says, men, you should have listened to me. Because if you had, you would have been spared all of this loss. I'm not talking to you right now. I'm talking to me. When we choose to reject God's will and ways and plans for our lives, the ultimate culmination of that choice is that we suffer loss. How much unnecessary waste, how much unnecessary loss could have been avoided if those sailors and ship owner and captain and Roman centurion had listened to the word of God through Paul. They would have spared all that. The ship would have still been in the harbor. 
all the grain would still be in the hole. The mask, the three masks would have still been standing tall. The sails would have still been wrapped up, ready to be raised and so they can bust through the sea. The lifeboats would have all still been there. All the tackle would have been there. But they wouldn't listen to God's voice, His word, His plan. In verse 22 it says, If you had listened to me, you would have avoided all this damage and loss. Never once, never once, never once have I ever experienced true waste and loss where God did not put people and messages in my life to try to keep me from going forward. The nice thing is, sometimes I listen. And every time that I've ever listened, I've been so glad I did. Some of the worst days of my life, God sent people into my life. God gave me words from His Word, from the Bible, and from message, from sermons, from teaching. But I wanted something so bad, I knew better. I had all the experts. I had the majority. Because the experts and majorities always tell you the truth. But at the end of the day, I wanted something. I wanted to do something. I wanted a different experience. I wanted to go in a different way. And God sent Paul's to my, into my life. Please don't do this. Please don't go forward. Please don't keep going in the same direction. And I said, I wanted to. And I suffered great loss and great damage. And many other people did too. Some of you did. God is not telling us ever to stop unless there is damage and loss ahead. God is in satisfaction. God is not trying to rob us of fun. God's not trying to keep us from fulfillment and satisfaction. He's not trying to keep us from fulfilling our hopes and dreams and plans. Paul wanted to go to Rome. God said, I'll do it. Because ultimately, the end of that journey for Paul was not suffer, was not damage and loss. So God said yes. But there was a point in this journey where God said, please don't go to that next harbor. Please stay in this harbor. We will not. We will not. Okay. And they sailed on and they lost Everything. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I'm trying to look forward. But it amazes me how people will come to me and want to get married. And I'll say, Austin, I'd love to marry y'all. But before we do, we're going to spend about 10 weeks Working on some stuff to get ready. Oh, no, we ain't got time for that. Woo, we ain't got time for that. I'm busy. I got stuff going on, man. I've got wartime conditions. We got all kinds of stuff going on. I do not have time to do that. And five years later, it's amazing how much time they have to sit in lawyers' offices. It's a miracle how we find time to fix what we have screwed up but we don't have time to do it right the first time. We always find time to take our kids to try to undo the damage that we've done by not raising them right. We find the time to go to second prayers. Uh, uh, what's that? Uh, Christian psych. We find the time. We always seem to find the time 
to address what we have screwed up when God says, why don't you do it right the first time? We, when's the last time you read your Bible? Oh man, I'm busy. I got a lot going on. You have no idea how busy I am. I don't have time to get God's wisdom. Hey, you want to go on a mission trip? I don't have time. I don't have time. But I wonder why I'm always so short with people. I don't have any mercy and compassion. I'm so self-focused. And everybody around me seems to be so unhappy with how selfish I am. But I don't have time to go on a mission trip. Where I can actually have my values changed for good. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm telling you for my own life. God, I'm not saying that every problem that we encounter is a result of our disobeying. You know that's not right. You know that's not right. And I'm not saying it that. I can be walking on water, floating in the clouds, healing lepers, curing the blind, uh, fixing governments, and, and, and defeating the devil, and I'll still run into terrible problems. Obviously, obviously, I am suggesting that if this story has any lesson at all, it is saying that God loves to warn His children of approaching danger. And He loves loss and difficulty and he loves to see them trust him enough to say, I hear you. And you wouldn't say it unless you, it was true because you can't say anything that's not true. And you wouldn't say it unless it was loving because you love me. So I trust you and I'll follow you and I'll obey you and I'll do what you want. And our lives end differently. Because we heeded the voice of the Lord. Samson, please stop going in the direction you're going. King Saul, please quit going in the direction you're going. The people that lived in Noah's day, please listen to the words of Noah. David, please stop going in the direction you're going. And I could give you example after example with Peter and Judas. The Bible is replete with people just like me and you. People that loved God just like me and you. People that God loved just like me and you. People that God was trying to warn and guide and instruct just like me and you. And God said, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this I'm because I love you. And some of them said, thank you. And heeded it. And their lives ended differently. And some of them said, thank you. But no thank you. And their lives ended differently. We don't have time for church. We don't have time to read the Bible. We don't have time for being in a, a, an accountability group. We don't have time to read rich, meaty, deep, uh, uh, wise character building books to fill our lives with the wisdom of God so that we can navigate our lives the way the, in, in ways that will ultimately lead us to great places. We don't have time for that. But somehow we find the time to try to undo all the, the mess of not doing the right things first. Jeremiah 22 says, God says, I continually warned you when you were prosperous. But you said, don't bother me. You have been that way since your childhood. Continually unwilling to obey me. Proverbs 1 says, I called you so many times, but you wouldn't come. I reached out to you, but you paid no attention. You ignored my advice. And you rejected my counsel. And then Jesus said in Matthew 7. He who listens to and follows my teaching is wise. Like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. 
And when the rains and the floods and the winds crash down upon it, it won't collapse because it was built on a rock. But he who hears my teachings and doesn't follow them, that person is foolish like one who builds a house on the sand. And when the rains and the floods and the winds come, that house will collapse with a mighty crash. And finally, Psalm 1. Oh, the joys of those who delight in God's law and meditate on it continually. They're like flourishing and fruitful trees that don't wither and they prosper in all they do. But not the wicked. They create and experience worthless and scatter and they will not have a place that end in condemnation and judgment and they will not have a place among the godly. For the Lord guards the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. We'll stop there. My notes will be online if you'd like to give them, finish the rest. Man, God loves us. And oh, because He does, He wants to tell us about things in the future that we should embrace or that we should avoid. I've told you before, the pr people say, God, would you just speak to me? Dumbest prayer ever. And I pray it too. Biblically, the problem is never that God's speaking. God's speaking. The question is, am I listening? Am I listening? Never a problem with God speaking. The problem is, am I listening? God wants us to heed His loving, wise voice so that we can avoid great loss and damage. You think about that. Michael, Terry, y'all want to come up here and help me? Oh, you're doing the praying. Okay. All right. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And David, you and Ashley come up here and help me. Please. Um, we're going to have people on my right and my left that are up here to pray for you. If you have something you need us to pray for you about, they would love to do that. And they'll pray in faith. And they'll keep it between them and the Lord. Um, If you read the end of chapter 27 of Acts, how that story ends is the ship smashes into a sandbar and gets stuck and the waves break the ship up into a million little pieces. And right before the ship collapses, the, the, the announcement goes out, if you can swim for sure, swim. But if you can't swim, grab a hold of a piece of wood and hold on and get to shore. You'll get to shore. You know what we're celebrating today when we eat, drink this wine and eat this bread? We are celebrating as a community that we have discovered that we cannot get to shore unless we cling to something else. I can't get to heaven and I would like to suggest you can't either unless you and I cling to something else. It's not the wood from a ship, but it is the wood that our Savior hung upon. And if it's your belief, if it's your hope, if it's your testimony, there was a point in my life when I was five or 105, but I realized that if I had any chance of going to heaven, of having my sins forgiven, of having a relationship with God. It wasn't going to be based upon how smart I am or how pretty I am or how much money I accumulate or how many good deeds I do. The only hope I've got is I want to cling to the Son of God and what He did for me on the cross. And what the Bible says is that as we cling to Him, the Bible says that He's been clinging to us all along. Isn't that lovely? I'm clinging to God. But the Bible says God's been clinging to me all along. So if that's your hope, that's your testimony, that's your belief, I invite you to come and eat bread and drink wine. Wine's purple. The yellow is grape juice. And uh, you eat 
and drink and you give thanks. You come.